Now, I was doing a, a talk in, in Leeds a couple of months ago. And I started to talk about some of the work that our next speaker had done. And Kevin, you might be interested to know that within two minutes of me speaking, somebody had fainted and we had to call an ambulance. So um, we're expecting more of that today. Um, if anyone's feeling woozy, just uh, put your head between your legs, your own legs, um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and just take a few deep breaths. Um, but I'd like to welcome on stage Professor Kevin Warwick. Thank you. I, I had lots of instructions as to it's a, a small stage. Maybe it's because I'm getting old or something, not to go too far. And if I'm going to do any dancing, I have to dance sideways. So um, just one thing I wanted to say before getting into the presentation, we're looking ahead into the future. So one, I want to start with an idea and then look at the things. We've heard lots of things about time and how it, it, the last two presentations have been about time. I just wanted to say something about the time. Because Neil, you've come across from Barcelona today, thank you very much, and when you did so, you had to flick back one hour. Isn't this crazy? What a stupid world we live in, that we have, you know, it's, this, it's five past three here, it's five past two in Barcelona, it's five past ten in New York. When are we just going to have one world time? I mean, it, it would work much, much better, and it has to be something that happens before 2045. So let's see when it happens. Let's all push for it. Maybe we can call it a Watford time. We'll just have one world time, so we can then, when we travel around, we can just, it's just the time. And if you go on the internet, you know what time is it. It's just the time. That's it. You don't have anything. Right. Now we're going to get into the main presentation. It, it comes a little bit full circle, unlike time probably, in that it's back to some of the things that Neil was talking about and this is the sort of thing if any of you have fancied, yeah it's cool, you know this Harbison guy, he's quite cool being this cyborg, I quite fancy being a cyborg myself, well this is a sort of do-it-yourself kit, this is really a list of experiments that uh, have been done then worked okay, and it's really giving you an idea. This is what's happened, and if you fancy a go yourself, this is what you could do. So that's what we're going to look at. Um, and the first one, now it's, it's really referred to as biohacking. Uh, that's the sort of the more, you know, the, the terminology, the genre terminology that's used. But th this is a very young, do you know, the, the, it hasn't changed a bit. This is the younger version of me, um, and this is back in one version of time. Um, and this is my GP, George Boulos, and what he's putting in my left arm is a radio frequency identification device. Um, and this essentially identified me to the computer in my building, and we just got the computer to do different things for me. So as I walked down the corridor, the lights came on because the computer knew it was me. I went to the laboratory and the door opened for me. I came in the front door, I said, hello, Professor Warwick. It was really cool, it was great fun. And that, but it's just that if you want something like this, it's like a smart card, but it's, it's inside your body. But what it's doing essentially is sending signals from, from inside your body to a computer, which then identifies you because of the implant and can do things for you. I mean, it could have stopped the, the you know, switched the light off, or it could have closed the doors, or whatever we wanted the system to do. And of course, at that time, various people criticized me, what did you ever want to do that for? No one's ever going to use it. But um, in the United States, people with epilepsy, um, now a lot of people there and diabetes now have small implants of this type. With a, it's a bit like the medical record that they can carry around with. So if they're in uh, urgent need of medication, the, the authorities know what treatment to give them. And I don't know if any, anybody here, I can't see very well, anybody here got a cat or a dog with a chip in them? Oh, it's quite, oh, thank you very much. Animal lovers in Watford, yeah. The, th oh, that's funny, the, the light, see, the chip still works. The lights come on. Um, I, I think those of you that have a cat or a dog, you can feel happy that the technology was fully tested on humans before your animal received the implant. Um, so that, that was then, this, is a, this isn't a close-up of the implant. This is a close-up of the implant. I mean, you could put that in your, your body, but this, this was what was actually implanted. Now, 
the, the same sort of thing you can get much, much smaller, the size of a grain of rice. It, you, you need then to excite it much more closely. This one worked um, about, well, at least one meter away. So just walking through a door frame was fine, but up to about two meters. So it has quite a reasonable range, but it's just working on induction. It's a wireless device. This doesn't have its own power. Power is induced in it. So it links in with all sorts of possibilities of transmitting power wirelessly, perhaps by other means, which is another thing, wireless power we, we, will be interesting, not just communications, but wireless power for the future. Now, some of the students, some of you here might have tried these things, but certainly some of the students at my own university, Reading, these are the, some of the projects they're doing involve sensory substitution. We, we heard from Neil earlier on about the human, very, very poor sensory input range, very limited set of frequencies, even the visual is very small, and the possibilities, therefore, of increasing the sensory range of humans is one big reason for looking at this. And this is what some of my students are doing. Um, this is Jawesh. You can see he's got his hand there, the, and the, a guy is putting an incision in one of his fingers. Um, and this is where you, you see a, a slight problem in the university because we have to get ethical approval for students to have implants put in them. And the guy that's doing this, you see he's got a tattoo there. That's because he is a tattoo artist, and uh, so he's not a medical person. And if you go on the, the, the web, you have a look for, you go for his trade name, which is Dr. Evil. That's what he calls himself, which presents us with enormous problems because on the university ethical approval documents, we, it, it, there's a question, who is carrying out the medical procedure? <laughs> there we go. But you see, there's, there is quite a bit, of, even a little fingerprint, you, know, you get blood, sort of Monty Python style for briefly squirt, squirting out. Um, here's some x-rays. What he's got implanted are permanent magnets just in the fingertips. You can see the two magnets there. Um, I, I have three students all together that are, are trying this technology. More from, a, not so much from an artistic, Neil, you should try this Neil, it's good. Um, not so much from an artistic point of view. This is very much more, we're looking at it from a scientific point of view. We're looking at the different sensory input and seeing, you're talking about learning, how quickly the person learns to use it. So those sort of aspects and how accurate it can be and so on. And uh, you can see now what we're doing. On the baseball cap are ultrasonic sensors. I think you, you mentioned ultraviolet and a few other, but ultrasonics for us is probably the easiest one, which is like a bat uses for flying around in caves. It gives a pretty accurate sense of distance. And a lot of people, um, maybe you use it with the robots quite a lot. It's, it's pretty robust and it's pretty simple. Um, and if you're going to feed it into humans, well, we'll see another example of this. It's quite cool for doing that. Now, the ultrasonic sensors are linked to the little coil of wire that is round Jawesh's fingers here. So what happens, essentially, as an object comes closer, it changes the current in the coil of wire, which vibrates the magnet. And as the object goes further away, so the magnet vibrates less. So essentially, we're changing the object the distance to an object, how far away an object is, into a, a sense of feeling, a sense of touch in this case, inside the finger. Right inside the finger, you have some very, very good receptors, about 200 hertz, it's very, very sensitive. And this way, you can get a pretty accurate sense of an object uh, and how far away the object is. So if, if you're, you're blind, you know, you can't you put, try this with a, a blindfold, you, you can, ah, yeah, there is something there, or there is something pretty accurately, you can detect how far away it is. Um, one of my students now, uh, Ian Harrison, he's got it connected up to an infrared detector. Now, infrared is like a heat sense from a distance. So he can move his finger around like that and detect how hot objects are a distance away. So this is clearly not a sense humans have. So he could scan around and if he's trying to find, ah, here's the hottest person in the room. Sorry about that, nothing about just personal. Um, it could have been anybody, but it could get into trouble. 
Uh, now, that's not, not in a sexual sense. Uh, that, that could be an even better sensory input. But in a, in a temperature sense, he's picking... I mean, that, maybe that's where the money is, in the, the sexual one. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. I've got to point to my wife. That's the yes, there's one there. there. Sorry, get, don't get annoyed with me, please. That's right. <laughs> So you can see it's taking different sensory input that humans don't have and giving us a sense as, as best we can. But we'll see perhaps better examples of that later on. Something a little bit different, um, but again, that you could, this is some work a guy called Paul Backy Rita did. He was an amazing guy. And it's communicating with the brain in different ways, which I think is what Neil is doing essentially in a different way. Now, what uh, Ashley, this is one of my, my students, Ashley, what he has built is this little array of electrodes that you put on your tongue. And this is something you learn to do very, very quickly. Very small currents are pulsed into, via the electrodes, into the tongue. It operates better at the back of the tongue, where it's much more sensitive. But somebody who's not tried this very quickly learns how to use it. And you can send in different patterns, different shapes, different letters. And what it's particularly good for is directions. You can send by moving a little cursor, if you like, by moving the, the cursor where it stimulates the tongue, it can tell you go left, go right, and the person very, very quickly. But shapes, you can put a shape in this, ah, oh, it's a triangle. And be, where they've had very, very little practice at doing it. So, it, and it's a very, very rapid, a very quick fire way of communicating with the brain. And when we're looking with how humans are interacting with technology, we're still tending to use the same modalities, the same sensory inputs, the vision we're relying on and touch and so on. Well, but there's other ways we can get into the brain, and this is an alternative route of getting more information into the brain, not via the visual route. And it is actually a very rapid fire way of getting information into the brain. Something different. I've called it rat brain robot. That's what it is. And if you want to have a look on YouTube, you can see some little videos of this thing in action. But I wanted to give you the main principles today. It's a little bit different, different type of cyborg. What we do, and again, this is experiments that are going on now and have been going on for a year or two. Um, we have little robots, again with ultrasonic sensors and little wheels so they don't fall over. We don't have to worry about that side. So that is the physical body of the robot, is the ultrasonic sensors and the wheels and its little, little typical mobile robot. The decision making, the brain of the robot, we don't use a human to operate it. We don't use a computer. What we do is give it its own brain. So here it says MEA, which is multi-electrode array. It's a little dish with electrodes on the bottom. And what we do typically is take brain cells from rat embryos. These are living brain cells. We separate them and put them in the little dish and the multi-electrode array. Feed them with minerals and nutrients. It's a little pink liquid, which has all sorts of energy that they want and the, the brain cells will connect up with each other very, very quickly. Uh, in fact, just within a matter of minutes, you can see them pushing out what look like tentacles, which then start linking up with each other and forming a network. So after about 10 days, we have, in this case, a, a two-dimensional brain with something like 100,000, more than 100,000, but about 100,000 brain cells. Uh, and after 10 days, we put it in a robot body. So we give it its body. And what we're getting it to do is learning, mostly by habit, how to move around in a little corral without bumping into things. So it's a very simple thing at the moment. But if we're looking into the future, then we can see where we're heading with it. And where we're heading, this is the multi-electrode array at the moment. And the, the black rings, that we have to have those to try and stop it dehydrating. We need to keep the brain moist. It's living. It's in an incubator at 37 degrees centigrade. We have to keep it there because it's living tissue. It's biological tissue. Um, and we can then send on the, the gold electrodes there, we can send stimulating pulses into the brain. And those stimulating pulses come from the sensors, the ultrasonics, if they're detecting an object. 
they stimulate the brain, pathway through the brain, zing, 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 zing. Output on other electrodes goes to the wheels of the robot to change direction. And then the robot will move around, detect an object, zing, 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 through the brain, change direction. And what we're looking at, at the brain itself, how quickly can it learn to do that, to move around without bumping in to objects and so on. So we can look at learning, we're giving it more sensors and, and all sorts of things to extend it further. Um, where we are now with it is uh, not just doing two dimensions, but using a latticed structure, which is a three-dimensional brain, culturing, uh, and that takes the number of brain cells, which is something I like, up to about 30 million brain cells. So it's still not the 100 billion of the human brain, but 30 million, you know, it's getting quite reasonable for a little robot, it's only a little robot, you know. And uh, with the other thing, we have human neurons as well. And, and it's, it's amazing how easy, I, I was surprised, how easy it is to get hold of human neurons. So um, we're using human brain cells, about 30 million in total, in a robot body, and we're looking at how the brain develops and how memories form and so on and so forth. So we're learning a lot about how the brain structure evolves. But it's a different type of cyborg um, where, you know, if anybody here would like to donate some of their brain cells to a robot, uh, please let me know and you can have a, a bit of you moving around uh, in, a, in a lab for a few months. Anyway. Um, something at one type of cyborg, some of the, the cyborg we may be looking at in a minute again, uh, is more for enhancement, saying, okay, humans, not very good in this respect, sensory input, communication, oh dear, as we say, but, and so on. But um, we can also use technology like this for therapy. And I, I mean, the, the sort of thing you're doing with the, the bone uh, conduction device, same ideas used for cochlear implants and, and things like that. Um, there are different versions, and one of them is deep brain stimulation, uh, which is used mainly for the treatment of Parkinson's disease, but this is where the surgeon will drill down into the central part of the brain, to the thalamus or the subthalamic nucleus, and put a spindle down into that part of the brain with electrodes on the bottom of the stimulus, typically about four or six electrodes. If somebody has a right and left Parkinson, then it involves two of these sets of electrodes being pushed, one in the right hand side, one in the left hand side of the brain. Then when the, the stimulation is switched on, the stimulation is it's on all the time, but it overrides the person's tremors uh, and uh, the muscle locking that you get. So it's an electronic way of counteracting the effect of Parkinson's disease. The same with epilepsy, it can counteract the effect. And for some people it means they then don't need the typical dopamine, the chemical treatment. They purely can exist uh, as a, a normal life. Some people it, it really does help enormously uh, and now there are thousands of people that have this treatment. The reason for saying this, what we're doing with surgeon Tipu Aziz and his team at the John Radcliffe at Oxford, is taking it one stage further and using the electrodes to record the activity deep in the brain, the electrical activity, to feed it into an artificial intelligence system, a computer, and that system then learns to recognise from the electrical activity deep in the brain when the tremors are going to start before they start. It's predicting ahead of time. So that when, rather than having this stimulating pulses all the time, it just stimulates on demand, when it needs to stimulate. But it needs to know when it needs to stimulate before the tremors start, because it takes a little bit of time to, to kick, kick the, the stimulation in to make sure the tremors don't start. And the AI system can actually predict about 20 seconds ahead. So essentially the AI system is monitoring activity deep in the human brain and is saying in 20 seconds time you are going to have tremors and muscle locking so it starts a stimulating pulse. The person themselves doesn't know they're going to have tremors and muscle locking until they actually start but the AI system does. And if we're looking ahead into the future, 2045 certainly, we will see many, many more AI systems, if you like, outthinking the human brain. 
doing things to stop the human brain doing it because they know what's going on in the brain even if the person themselves doesn't think they know what's going on, if you see what I mean. The final area, which is one we all want to, you know, we're all pretty limited, so let's enhance, let's improve. Um, ways to improve, uh, if you're not sure. Sensory, we've been talking about a lot, so why restrict yourself to sensing the world, about 5% of what's going on. Why not enhance your senses, have a much wider sensory input. Um, also memory, we all know, I nearly forgot that one. Memory is pretty awful, particularly as you get older. Biggest one for me though, communication, because I'm, when I see how well technology communicates and how poorly humans communicate, I mean, it's embarrassing. Surely we must be embarrassed by this. I mean, when you think about it, we all have highly complex electrochemical signals in our brains for our ideas, images, thoughts, feelings, all of those things going on in our brains. And if we want to communicate those to somebody else, what do we do? We convert those highly complex signals into trivial coded mechanical signals, either speech, pressure waves, that are very slow, it's a serial signal, it's very error prone, or some movement, and the difference to a mechanical signal, we're typing something into the internet. So we're converting this highly complex signal into this trivial coded message, which is what language is essentially. And then the, the signal will travel and travel. If it's a, a sound signal, somebody's ear will convert back from this mechanical signal into an electrochemical signal. And of course, I mean, even if you've been married for 40 or 50 years, you say, what is she trying to say to me? I kind of sound... Surely we should get with the technology that there is and just send signals directly from brain to brain. I mean, then we, we can send ideas and images and feelings. Never mind 3D printing. Let's just 3D signals, brain to brain. Let's go straight away. And then it doesn't matter from me, from a university point of view, I'm going to have to start exam questions now. If we do this, we don't need exam questions because I sent the message. We know the person's got the message. I don't need to. It's going to save an awful lot of time. So communication, brain to brain, thought communication has to be one of the big advantages of enhancement, hopefully well before 2045. All it means is a small implant, but hey, come on. This is a picture of me again at the Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford, the last implant that I had. Um, there were four neurosurgeons involved. It was a two-hour neurosurgical operation. What I had implanted in my left arm, in my nervous system, the median nerves in my left arm, was... Th this is when, you, when you're saying about people maybe not feeling very well, I think. It was a, um, The record is four people in, a, in an audience, uh, but I show some pretty awful pictures, so this is, this is pretty nice. I have, to, I have to say that was up at a, a Cambridge college, I think. Those Cambridge people can't take it. But we had four people, four people faint. Um, this is, uh, it was called the Utah Array. It's now called the Brain Gate, has been for a while. Um, it's 100 spikes with electrodes on the end. The electrodes are about two to three micrometers in diameter, which is about the same size as nerve fibers or small neurons. Neuron brain cells, typically two to maybe even up to 30 micrometers, certainly two to 20. So it's, it's very high resolution. You know, potentially you're getting one to one, certainly one electrode picking up signals from two, three, four uh, nerve fibers or neurons. It's very high resolution compared to the the, the ECG, the electrodes that are stuck on the outside, for some people use. Um, you may you probably do some half a sheet with the electrodes on the outside that are picking up. I, I mean, a lot of labs do it. We played around with it for a while, but yeah, they're yeah, unreliable. they're unreliable. I mean, I, thank you very much. I, I didn't plant him in the audience. That's why. They, I mean, they're unreliable because you're picking up from millions, maybe 20, 30 million neurons, all the radial signals from them and it's very difficult to get signal processing to accurately represent. So you can, with these, you can get somebody to control a little buggy. Seven or eight times out of 10, it goes the direction you want, and two or three times it... The weather, or if you had a cup of coffee, or had sex the night before, that sort of thing. And it, it, does, it operates different, differently. With this, you have very, very high resolution, and it's input-output. 
is the point. It's bi-directional. You're just plugging into the nervous system or plugging into the brain. So you can monitor signals, but you can also push signals in. And what we did, this, this was implanted in my nervous system for just over three months. And uh, what we did was a range of things. And Neil, you were saying about a five month training period. This was, uh, it's about six or seven weeks, but it was very, very simple. So this was simple signals um, to stimulate my nervous system that my brain could recognize. And what we did then was use ultrasonics again, because that for us is very easy. So you see there on the baseball cap are ultrasonic sensors. I'm wearing a blindfold. The output from the ultrasonic sensors was going down into my nervous system. So as the closer an object came, my brain was receiving pulses of electric current that increased in frequency the closer the object and this object further away, so the pulses died away. And again, very quickly you learn to, over a matter of weeks, learn to use this type of input. So if anybody does want an ultrasonic sense, yeah, you know, put your name down, you, you can have it now. Uh, my wife who's with me today, she helped in the experiment in a number of ways. And she's wearing there some jewellery that a student at the Royal College of Art put together. And the jewellery changes colour from red to blue. So how we had got it operating, because the jewellery via the implant was linked to the signals on my nervous system. So how we had got it operating was if I was calm and relaxed, my wife's jewellery was blue. And if I started getting excited, so the jewellery started flashing red. Now, she doesn't work in the university, works in a completely different office. So if you imagine the scene now, she is in her office, the jewellery is blue. Fine, he's not doing anything he shouldn't. And <laughs> then the jewellery starts flashing red. What is he doing? And more importantly, who is he doing it with? So I don't know whether that's a good idea or not, but... Um, this was taken in Columbia University. We worked with the, the guys in computer science there to put my nervous system onto the internet in real time, live. It, it even had, my nervous system had an IP address. Um, but we, we, the security was that we didn't tell people we were doing it. So we just went and did it and we didn't say. Uh, but what we did was link, I'm not sure whether you can see, there's a robot hand there and what we did was link my nervous system in New York with the robot hand which stayed in Reading in England. So as I moved my hand in New York, my neural signals, my brain signals which we could pick up via the implant sent across the internet to move the robot hand in Reading. So there's a slight time delay but the hand was just mimicking my hand movements. When the robot hand gripped an object, there's little sensors in the fingertips and signals were sent back from the robot hand across the internet to stimulate my nervous system. Again, this, this increase or decrease in frequency dependent on how much force the hand was applying. So it was a very, very simple, just a, a serial signal, very simple signal. Um, the more the hand was gripping, the, the increased frequency, the less it gripped, so the frequency died away. So if the hand was just touching, the pulses were so slow, almost you know, one hertz down to below one hertz, one, one cycle per second. And what I was trying to do without looking was to open and close my hand, to open and close the robot hand to just get it to operate and, and grasp onto an object. Um, but remembering that the robot hand was on a different continent. So it does mean, if we're looking to the future, that you, with implants, you can extend your nervous system across networks. You can have your nervous system going onto other planets. Your brain and your body do not have to be in the same place in the future. Your brain can be wherever you want. It may be here in Watford if you want, if that's what turns you on. And your body can be wherever you want it to be, wherever the network takes you. It doesn't have to be, some of your body might be in the same place, but it doesn't have to be in the future. And then my wife helped again um, with the last part of the experiment, which for me was the most exciting. Um, she had electrodes pushed into her nervous system from the outside. 
without anaesthetic, I have to say. So this is a labour of love, as you might call it. I mean, it is. if you do try it, tr please try it tonight if you want, but you will find pushing electrodes into your nervous system is extremely painful. And the, the, we thought the doctor was going to give us some anaesthetic for this, but he said, no, 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 I need to make sure that I've made a good contact. So he pushed the electrode in and <laughs> screamed, and the doctor said, oh, I think we've made a good contact there. <laughs> But as you can see here, there's two um, little banana clips, so you put two electrodes in. And when we went back to the lab, what we did was electrically linked our nervous systems together. So when Irena closed her hand, my brain received a pulse. And then it was, you know, ding, 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 so ding, ding, ding. So we were communicating electronically, directly between our nervous systems. Now, I know for some of you, you might think, oh, yeah, that's quite cool. Some of you, what the hell is he talking about? I mean, it's, it's like the first basis, technically, of sending signals from brain to brain. And what we were doing was really showing from nervous system to nervous system, tick the box. You can do that, and the person can very quickly understand and learn that you are sending more telegraphic, very simple telegraphic signals that you can communicate in that way. So that when we do go ahead, which surely we will do, into brain-to-brain -brain communication with lots more electrodes, we will be able to start understanding thoughts and images and feelings and actually move ahead into the future to a whole new exciting world where hopefully most of us will be cyborgs. Thank you very much. Now, Kevin, you talk about that we'll be able to do brain to brain. Hmm. How far away is that, do you think, before we can get to that stage where we can actually just sort of think about that Wikipedia entry without actually having to? I, I think to do the first experiments is the technology is there now. It's really, you know, maybe you can say we need some ethical approval, but it's just getting on and doing it, really. So it's finding a friendly surgeon or two, and we can do it. But that is quite a way from what you're saying, and I don't know how quickly that will move from there. It really is down to experimentation, maybe how quickly it is picked up socially, and also commercially, or in a military sense, how much money comes into it. Because frankly, if you were now, not you, the poor person that you are, but you know, if, you, if you had this in, enormous checkbook and said, here's uh, you know, $5 billion, Neil and Kevin, go ahead and do this experiment, then we'd probably say, yeah, okay, that sounds cool, let's go and do it. Mm. Uh, it's that sort of thing. The technology really, I think, is there, but it, it requires that bit of partly social acceptance of what, what's going on, um, for any ethical concerns there are, but partly uh, that bit of influx of money. But, you know, things like that happen, so. And do you find that there are sort of, you, you were mentioning the having to fill out the ethics forms mm. so that people could get uh, just magnets put under their, their fingers. Yeah, yeah. Um, are there some, do you have to go through an approval process for some of this stuff? And have you had stuff knocked back? Um, yeah, there's various levels. The, the implant that I had, we needed to get approval from the university, but also from the health authority, because the surgeons that are carrying out the operation, they need approval from their health authority to do the procedure. And that is quite a laborious process. If it's just a, two or three people that are involved, then probably that's all that's needed. But if you were going to try it on, you know, let's say this audience, then you would be into medical devices agency and you'd have all sorts of safety things to look at and it would be, you know, we're, we're talking 10 years before we can go ahead with it. So it is one thing when you're just experimenting either yourself or just a small number, you, and hence with the students, it's just individual students who really want to do something. We're not enforcing implants on every new student to the University of Reading, I have to say that. So it's just specific students that really want to do something. Um, even then, it's laborious. Uh, the, the one, but we've also got society and what society thinks. And quite a few years ago now, there were two little girls, Holly and Jessica, who some of you may remember in the news, they were abducted and they were murdered. And this created quite a stir because they were missing for 
two or three days, I don't remember exactly, and might have been saved if people had known where they were. So the possibility there, oh, if these girls had a little implant under the skin that we, we, we could track them, wouldn't that could have saved their lives? Wouldn't it be good? So I was asked to actually come up with something that could be, that potentially parents could use for a, a little implant under the skin, very similar to the, the RFID thing I had. And I said, yeah, well, let's, let's go and do that. And uh, locally, a news agency came forward with a little girl and said, here's the volunteer, and the parents were happy with it. And instantly, there was something of a backlash. The children, the NSPCC and Kidscape said, this, you are a terrible person putting this thing under, you know, suggest, just, just, you know, I'm just a scientist, I'm just trying to, Trevor McDonald did a program saying what a terrible person I was to suggest doing things like this when there was all these other better methods. So I, I all right, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, so I didn't do it. So there is also, and I've never have done, even though I still get emails and letters from parents saying, please don't tell anybody, but please could our child have that device because we want them to be safe, which I still do on a regular basis. So I have never gone ahead with that. More from societal feedback saying we're not comfortable with this. Kevin, that's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Cheers, thank, thank you. you. <laughs>